Okay, and we are live with Vindicast number 23, I think. Yeah, this is 23. I have a replay today uh, from a good friend of mine who plays Zerg on the North American ladder. I've been asking him to submit me replays for a while now, just because, like, you know, I wanted to give him a little bit of support as a player. And he finally got around to sending me one, so I'm hoping that this will actually be a good replay. Uh, once again, this is a Masters level replay from the North American ladder, and this will be a Zerg versus Terran on Shakura's Plateau. Now, um, this map's actually interesting in a lot of ways, rather unique in a lot of ways for this matchup, but I'll get to that in a moment. First, let me introduce our players. Uh, spawning in the top right position, we have the Red Terran. Uh, spawning on the map, Shakura's Plateau. He is a Master's Terran on the North American ladder. We have Good Knight. And spawning over here in the top left, we have uh, one of my good friends of mine. When you guys, uh, when I tell a lot of Star uh, StarCraft 1 stories, uh, this guy's usually involved because he was playing with me in StarCraft 1 for such a long time. We have our Blue Zerg player, also a Masters level player on the North American ladder. He is green. Okay. Now, uh, I wanted to get into a little bit about this map. This map is very unique for um, Terran versus Zerg in a lot of different ways. Uh, the most important thing about this map is the layout of the middle. The layout of the middle is such that it is very easy for Terrans, especially, to carve this map in half and make it very difficult for Zerg to uh, traverse across it with ground troops. The other thing about it, and this is very similar to what you'll see on Antigua Shipyard, is that the main base is located not one level up, but two levels up the low ground of the middle of the map. So why that's important is because that promotes a lot of really powerful drop play. Uh, the reason why the drop play is a lot more powerful on this map than it would be on a lot of others is because if you are trying to defend, say, the fourth base and the first base at the same time, uh, you usually have your troops positioned in the center on the low ground because that's the middle position that you can like use to like either rally back and forth between your main and your fourth base. And the thing is, is that because you have to traverse up across two different ramps, it is such a long, it's a deceptively long travel time by ground if you are looking to be the player defending against drop play. So that's one of the reasons why uh, this map is very different and actually why Terrans like this map a lot. The layout is very easy for Terrans on this map to uh, secure it from run buys and all sorts of ground uh, attacks with siege tanks utilizing both the, uh, the really good position that these watchtowers provide from the middle but also these cliffs that are in the middle and also the fact that they are so, uh, this map is so prominent for its ease, uh, its ease of drop play. It's one of the reasons why it's typically, traditionally, this map has been a Terran favored map. I was actually just having a discussion with uh, Green not so long ago about how come he doesn't have this map vetoed as a Zerg player. Because if I was a Zerg player and I played Zerg like you know exclusively, this would be one of the maps I would have vetoed. But obviously, Green feels very comfortable on this map, so we'll have to see what kind of strategy he has in mind for. Um, Good Knight here, who does look like he's going to be taking this one rank six man. This seems to be the most popular uh, build that I've seen since uh, the patch, where uh, those early that that queen buff really didn't, really punishes a lot of very early uh, bunker pressure and or hellion pressure. So uh, this very fast gases expand, which is almost in, which is almost identical to the type that Terrans use against Protoss, uh, it has become like almost a staple opening for Terrans in Terran vs Zerg. I've noticed at least at this at least at this level. I think it's really just a matter of comfort, really. I mean, I, I, I'm almost certain that, like, if we were to go to the Korean server, for example, and the Koreans, if you guys don't know, are a lot more uh, aggressive. They're known for being a lot more aggressive, especially in the early game, than what you'll see on the North American and European ladders. I think that you would see a very different style of Terran being played over there, but this is a very passive uh, one Rax uh, command center opening, and pretty much gives the Zerg free range to drone up to a certain up, up until a certain point of time, and at that point they will um, use, the Terran usually moves out with some form of timing attack and or harassment. You see, you'll see a lot of Banshee play, a lot of Hellion play. What's been really popular lately has been the mixing of Hellions with Marines because that push is so easy to use with uh, just mineral units. So that's one of the things that uh, I'm expecting to see out of our Terran player. But out of green, this is actually a little unusual. It's actually pretty risky, too. Uh, he is going for that fast third base located down here at the bottom left position. 
I, I thought I had to sneeze there for a second, so I didn't want to like leave my mic on for that. So this is actually really interesting. Um, this map is very easy. Uh, it's very. I should, um, let me try and rephrase this. On this map, it's very difficult to defend this particular position if an opponent already has map control. The reason why is because you have to leave the safety of your base and travel down this ramp. And when you're doing that, all of your forces are very vulnerable to, say, siege tanks or a well-positioned concave at the bottom of the ramp. So trying to defend against trying to defend this position from an early timing attack is very difficult to do. So Green is really hoping that his opponent is not going to scout this base until he has it fully saturated and is able to take advantage of that very early economy that he has. Now the one thing is that uh, Good Knight does have these Hellions out on the map, so these Hellions will give him a good amount of scouting information if he uses them correctly. Now the one thing that Good Knight has to make sure that he doesn't do is that he doesn't sacrifice these two Hellions to try and get like any drone kills or anything like that, but it does look like that's what he's going to do. Uh, though he does lose one Hellion immediately trying to get up that ramp, trying to cause some damage, and now the Hellion actually is going to be scouting around here. He he does look to see that there is no fast third taken there, but he didn't scout up here. So this is a really clever move by Green. He does know that the Terran is going to be very likely to scout this third base location located over here, where Xerxes will usually take it. But he did not scout up that one additional ramp to check to see if there's a third base located up here. So Green might actually get away with this very greedy, uh, this very greedy play that he's doing on this map. This is the other thing about this map that makes it so uh, so unfavorable for Zergs half the time, is that it's very difficult to take this position um, if you're trying to go for a very fast uh, very fast third base against Terran on this map. So a lot of the time you'll end up with a two base versus two base for a little while. And that's not something that Zerg likes to find themselves in. Zerg likes is very comfortable when they are ahead in bases on their opponent. So we have these Hellions up on the map. They were able to snipe one creep tumor. Uh, Green could have canceled that, but he was a little slow about he was a little slow about doing it. So he did lose that one creep tumor. Uh, it does look like our Terran player is going for a lot of Marines. He is getting Stim and Medivacs down and a Starport down, which will allow him to produce Medivacs. So it does actually look like we are going to be seeing this Marine Hellion Medivac push. This has actually been a pretty popular push. It hits before Siege Mode is usually done, and the thing is that because you are not over reliant on gas right now, uh, it doesn't really cut into your ability to produce SCVs all that much because you're still only really utilizing SCVs for mineral production. Now, the one thing that it does that it is relatively vulnerable to is Bane Links. Now, the one thing about the Siege Tank timing push is, is that uh, Zerg players can't really utilize Bane Links all that well when those initial pushes are coming because two reasons. One, they don't usually have an armor upgrade, which means that those Bane Links get one shot by Siege Tanks. The second thing about them is that Bane Link speed is usually not finished before Siege Mode is done. So you're really dealing with slow Bane Links against Siege Mode. But with a push like this, these banelings are actually going to be very, very powerful against the push that Good Knight is actually moving out with right now. Now, these Marines don't have combat shields. There's only a single medevac out on the field, and there's Hellions. Now, all of these units are very vulnerable to banelings and roaches, which is the exact unit combination that Green, that Green has going for him. So he's very experienced dealing with a push like this. We do have an engagement coming down here. Those banelings did explode on a couple of Hellions. The roaches were actually able to get out of there okay. But now Green knows exactly what kind of unit composition his opponent is coming with. And here comes the engagement. They're moving, uh, we do have troops moving up the ramp for good night. They are going to engage that spine crawler, and all of these roaches are now in position. They are targeting down all of those marines and hellions, but here comes the stim. That stim is allowing those marines to do a ton of DPS to all of those roaches. No queens have gone down for green, which is a pretty big deal. Green did pull drones in that to try and repel this attack, but the thing is there's only a single medevac out on the field, which green does eventually snipe, but he does lose a queen in the process, so a lot of trading going on for both players. Green does lose a handful more of zerglings, but now all of those marines are very badly damaged. He needs another medevac over on the field in order to be able to heal all of that and will he actually be able to get it in there in time because he did not actually do all that much damage to green he only killed three workers in that now at this point because of that fast third green can afford to trade troops with his opponent right now what he really can't afford to lose is any hatcheries or all that many drones now the thing is is that good knight is using this aggression to protect his own expansion attempt and this is actually a really good use of this attack but the thing is he's gonna need to switch into siege tanks at some point unless he wants to go for a full bio based army which it does look like he's going for i don't know if i agree with that green is already getting is getting more banelings up and he does already have that infestation pit down so he will be able to start producing investors and he already has that pathogen gland upgrade already researching 
Now it does look like uh, Good Knight does get it is get a scout at this th this fourth base location for Green. Green is fourth base is in a lot of trouble. He needs to send those circling and those up there to deal with this army. But I don't know if Good Knight goes for that really fast snipe on that hatchery. I think he might get it, but that is a lot of really red marines. There's only a single medevac in there, so all those marines are very, very badly damaged. I think these Zerglings actually might be enough to clean them up, but that is really good marine positioning for Good Knight. But those uh, Banelings do come in, but now here come all of the Roaches, and it does look like Good Knight will be able to pick up all of those marines and get them out of there. He did manage to kill a lot of drones as well as a couple queens, but he was able to get down the spine collars. But the most important thing about that engagement was that he did get the hatchery. Green was able to save that hatchery. That is a big save for Green, but he is moving those units away, and Good Knight is not done yet. It does look like he wants to go in there and snipe a few more drones. He is getting a lot more drone kills, but a good, but a, a really clutch timing on that certainly spawn does allow Green to be able to pull away those Marines for just long enough to save that drop, but Good Knight has done what he wanted to do. He has done some economic damage to his opponent while he's establishing his own third base, and now we have the transition into Siege Tank. So this is a very late Siege Tank transition. There is going to be a timing where Green can abuse the fact that his opponent does not have Siege Mode available, but he has a lot of Zerglings and a lot of Valens, and he will have Roaches out in the field very, very, very soon. Now, the thing about Siege Tanks is that Siege Tanks are really, really good against dealing with both Banelings and, Roach and Infestors. So we do have a, a link run by coming down here. We'll get into the, the investor thing in just a moment. These Zerglings are doing some damage to the SCV line of Good Knight. They are doing a lot of damage to the SCV line of Good Knight. Good Knight is taking a lot of SCV casualties. That third base has been completely stripped of workers. And these Roaches and these Banelings are actually doing a really good job of repelling the pure Marine army that... Good Knight actually has. So Good Knight doesn't actually have a lot of troops out on the field right now. A lot of his troops were actually used up in those initial attacks. He is making 10 Marines at a time, so his production is very, very good. But that lack of siege tanks and that lack of bunkers at the third base really cost him very dearly. He did lose that command center. He didn't even lift it off, which I thought was a really bad blunder on Good Knight's part. So Good Knight has been reduced back down to three bases, and it does look like Green is going to be expanding again behind this, which is a really good thing for him to do. He is getting up Infestors, and he is going for Hive Tech, so Green's playing this out very, very well right now. He is transitioning into higher tech units to deal with the Siege Tank count that his opponent will be having, and he is getting further ahead of his opponent economically. Now, the one thing that Good Knight is not actually going for, actually does look like he's going for that right now. He is going for some drop play against Green. This is what he should have been doing from the very beginning with this unit composition instead of fighting out in the open, but he tried to get that hatchery down, and he wasn't actually able to secure it, and the thing is, is that Green's economy is actually really, really good at this point. He's already up to 71 drones, even though he has lost a few he already has spine crawlers in position because he knows how good drops are in this map. So those spine crawlers will repel that medevac with the aid of those zerglings. So now, good night. Where do you go from here, dude? Where do you go from here? You don't have that third base anymore. If you try to establish it right now, you are still going to be a little bit late. The thing is, I think that Goodnight would have been a lot better off had he tried to take the third base position located here as opposed to this one over here and turn it into a planetary fortress. That's normally what you can do if you're being safe, but I think Goodnight was just felt that he was safe with all that aggression that was uh, masking for him. Now, here comes the down. This drop is doing some damage to Green. He did lose a single evolution chamber, but he hasn't lost any drones in. He's trying to get down the second evolutionary chamber, but Green doesn't look like he's going to be even bothering with that drop. He is advancing forward with a lot of investments and a lot of circles. Good Pogo Bros. Super down on all those Marines, and Good Knight does lose a ton of units there, but Green can't really afford to lose all of his investors. Good Knight is focused firing those investors. He does take down a lot of them, but in the end, the supply is at 107 for, for Green, 86 for Good Knight. That drop was eventually cleared out. It did manage to do some damage, sniping both of the evolution chambers, which is going to put is going to set Green back a little bit in terms of upgrades. His opponent's upgrades are actually really, really good right now. Uh, Good Knight is getting a plus two, plus two for his Marines. He doesn't have an armory down. Oh, yes, he does. He does have that armory down. He isn't researching uh, plus one uh, vehicle damage, which I think is a little interesting, but it doesn't really look like he has the economy to go for vehicle upgrades in addition to being able to maintain all that production of units that he's going for. Okay, so now we finally see what high uh, unit Green is actually going for. He is going to be going for the Ultralisk. The Ultralisk, I think, is an interesting decision because on this map, the the middle is very unfriendly to Ultralis because of how many chokes that are in there. Ultralis favor more of a wide open middle, and this map is usually better for Broodlords because that high ground, low ground thing that I was talking about earlier with the double high ground, low ground, that actually is really, really good for Broodlords because that gives them a lot of, like, you know, a lot of height to fire from. 
So we have a double expand going down here for Good Knight. This is what this is the sort of thing that he needs to do if he wants to get back into this game economically. But it doesn't really look like Green is going to be letting up on the pressure. Now I don't know if he can actually attack into that position. There are a lot of siege tanks there. That is a very narrow choke for Green to be funneling all of his units in. But it does look like he is only trying to keep Good Knight on his side of the map while he gets those ultralists up. Those ultralists might be what he needs to barrel into that siege tank count. Now Good Knight did go for this expansion over here, but though, but Green already had those overlords in position, so he was able to spot it. Uh, Good Knight is getting Siege Tanks in position. He's trying to protect his expansion from those Zerglings who are trying to pick away at those rocks, but at this point, Green's economy is still just so very good. He does have a very large mineral bank right now. Meanwhile, Good Knight does have a good bank himself, but he isn't really spending all of his money, and he's still, he's only making Marines, Siege Tanks, and Medivacs, he's, and he has halted Medivac production. He is going to need to swap into Marauders if he wants to deal with the Ultralist count that Green is going for. Ooh, and here's an here's an interesting move that Green is actually going for. He is getting down this Nidus Worm. This is something that Green likes to do a lot. Uh, this is something that he favored a lot in StarCraft 1 was the use of that Nidus Canal. And so this is one thing that Green likes to do a lot that I'm actually really, really supportive of. Uh, he likes to use this Nidus Network. He likes to use Nidus Worms in combination with those Ultralists because it, it allows them to kind of rid themselves of one of their core uh, deficiencies as a unit, which is that mobility. So these, this uh, Nidus Network is actually a really good call for just in enhancing the mobility of those ultralists and now he's actually going to use it to clear out this net this uh this fourth base of good knight good knight is not going to expect this um this Nidus Worm over here, and it is, and he doesn't really have, well, he did actually clear out the rocks over there, so he is actually able to protect that expansion if he wants to, but this Nidus Worm is going to force a lot of units out of the, out of the middle position for Green, which will allow him to move his army further into the center of the map if he actually wants to, but it does look like he wants to commit to this attack on the fourth base. We do have a double medevac drop. That drop does have a siege tank in it going for the top expansion of Green, but Green's forces are relatively in position. He has a lot of units down here at the, the at down at the bottom of his natural ramp, so that will allow him to get back in time to save his main base from this drop. Uh, this Nidus attack from Green actually did force a lift off on that command center, but he wasn't actually able to get it. We do have a secondary drop coming down here at the bottom position of Green. The fourth base is under attack by these Marines. There are no units in position. These Zerglings, see how long it takes for these Zerglings to run back over here. This is what I meant about drop play on this map. Drop play is so good because of how long it takes for ground units, even these really, really fast Zerglings on creep to move from one position to another, and the thing is, Good Knight is not done yet. He does have those medevacs still in position, hovering over the top of Green's first, of Green's main base, but there are a lot of spine crawlers and a lot of spore crawlers in position for Green that will do a very good job of deterring Good Knight from going for that drop play at his, at his main base. We did, have an, we did have an Ultralisk attack coming over here at the top right position that I missed. There's just so much action going on in this game. These players are really impressing me with their use of mobility on this map and multitasking. Green did go for that attack on the main base of Good Knight. It, does, it doesn't really look like he did much damage to Good Knight's infrastructure, although it does look like he killed a substantial number of SCVs, but the SCV count for Good Knight is still up at 56, and so that is still a pretty good SCV count for Good Knight, who does look like he's going to be taking his fourth base over here at the third base base location on this map. Now this is almost going to certainly be a planetary forge. This is one of the things that Terran needs to utilize on this map against Zerg. They can protect their expansion so much easier thanks to those planetary fortresses than Zerg realistically can with spine crawlers and spore crawlers. So he needs to turn this into a planetary. He needs to continue constructing planetaries all over the map that will really hinder his opponent's ability to move wherever he wants. Green is going for that spire at this point. It does look like he is looking to transition out of this ultralist tank and into Broodlords at some point in the match. It does look like we will have an engagement before that. That is a really good siege up time for Good Knight's doing a lot of damage to the Zerglings and Banelings in that army, but unfortunately for Green, most of those Ultralists were spared from that initial shelling. There are still no vehicle upgrades on those on those siege tanks. They're going to lack a lot of the punch that they need to punch through that very heavy five armor that those Ultralists are currently like boasting right now. Now this is the position, this is the money position that a lot of Terrans like to find themselves in, especially since there are no Broodlords out on the field. This Siege Tank line is going to be very difficult for uh, Green to maneuver around. He doesn't really have Banelings in that army. A majority of that stopping power that he's going to be needing for that Siege Tank line are those Ultralists, but does he have enough? And are Ultralists going to be what he needs to get through that line? We have another attack coming up here at the, at the, natural, at the main base of Good Knight. There are Ultralists and Roaches in there, and majority of Green's, of Good Knight's army is actually out of position. So, Green is actually doing to Good Knight right now what a lot of Terrans are so fond of doing to Zerg at this point. He's using these Nidus Worms to Nidus all over this map. 
really doing what I was actually advocating for Good Knight to do in this game, but he's doing it with Nidus Swarms. I love this. I love what Green is actually doing in this game right now. This is so cool. This is so underutilized for Zerg, especially on this map, and Good Knight is actually just being completely out maneuvered at this point. His tank line is in the center. It's still very powerful, but he has no Marines to actually buffer for those siege tanks, so Green is actually sp is actually spreading Good Knight's defenses so thin that it, if any at any one point, it will actually allow him to charge that tank line and do a lot of damage. We have another Nidus Worm over here with Ultralis and Zerglings in it. It does look like Green's target for this attack is that fourth base location for Good Knight. Good Knight doesn't have any troops in position to actually deal with that Nidus attack. There are Ultralis in position. These Ultralis and these Zerglings are going to do a ton of damage to this base. This base is being turned into a planetary fortress, but that isn't going to do much good for those SCVs that have been cleared out of that fourth base location. It does look like Green will lose one Ultralis, but those other Ultralis are going to flee back to the safety of that Nidus Worm. I love what Green is doing here. This is such a smart use of the Nidus Worm, especially on a map that is so traditionally favored for Terran in the matchup. Now the thing is that Good Knight does have a lot of supply hog, uh, tied up in the siege tanks, but he hasn't really been able to do anything with this tank line because he has been on the defensive this entire game. Now the one thing is that because he's been on the defensive this entire game, that will give that is giving green the window of opportunity he needs to transition into broodlords those broodlords are going to be the siege buster unit he needs to do to deal with that tank line and we have an ultras and circles in the main base and actually there are no troops up here it doesn't actually look like good knight is actually interested in dealing with that night swarm attack he is going to advance forward but there are already broodlords out on the field and all the while this is actually happening there are already Siege tanks and uh, Ultralis and Zerglings picking away at the production, and Good Knight leaves the game, realizing that the defenses of Green in the middle of the map are actually just too strong. Great play by Green. It doesn't look like Green stayed in the game just long enough to actually deal with all those siege tanks in the middle. So it does look like he wanted that little bit of satisfaction before actually leaving the game. I don't actually know if Green actually knows that his opponent already left the game. Yeah, but Good Knight is already out of the game, so we're really at this point just enjoying the, the massacre that these Ultralists are going to inflict on these defenseless parents whose general have already fled from the battle. So they are just panicking right now. They are running for the hills, and that's the end of the replay. That was really cool. Okay, so I know when Green submitted me this replay, uh, he was really, really excited about it. He like he was really excited to like have me cast it. And I was wondering why, and that did not disappoint. I really, really like what he did in this game, utilizing these Nidus Worms to really turn the table. Like I said before, when I was starting this game off, this map is so popular for drop play, Terran drop play in this matchup because of how difficult it is to defend both your main base and your fourth base location located on opposite sides of Shakur's Plateau because of how long it takes to traverse from the low ground here, which is where his troops were, all the way back up to deal with this Nidus Worm, to deal with this Nidus Worm over here. He, there was just a non-stop pressure, and he wasn't actually able to advance forward at any point because he constantly had to send troops back to deal with it. So what he needed was a turret ring wall. He needed you know, troops that were stationed everywhere. He needed a really good amount of, a, of defensive awareness. But that's the thing, though. Terrans don't ever usually have to deal with stuff like that. They don't. They have. They never deal with drops from Protoss. They never deal with drops or Nidus Worms from Zerg. So they just do not have that mentality. Meanwhile, over such a long course of the metagame, Protoss and Zergs have gotten so accustomed to doing Terran drop play that now Terrans have had to kind of figure out different ways to attack and, you know, to to gain map control and be aggressive without having to rely so heavily on drops because the other races have gotten so good at dealing with it. But the flip side of that is that because Terrans have not had to deal with drops very often in so many matchups, that is a brilliant window of opportunity for you Zerg and you Protoss players out there to take advantage of the weakness in your Terran op opponent's, you know, mental capacity, really. They don't have that I mean, information stored in their head because uh, most Terrans don't have experience with it. Good Knight was clearly taken off guard by this constant Nidus Worm Ultralisk attack by Green. I really love this. This is very unconventional, but it, is, it was nonetheless effective. Good Knight just did not have the multitasking to deal with it, and that was just a brilliant play by Green on this map. Good game. I'm glad I got to cast that.
If you would like your own replay cast, uh, let me know. Send me an email at uh, kcvinicare at hotmail.com. I will be casting for the ISTL tomorrow, which is Sunday. Uh, I will be starting at around 12 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. This uh, this cast that I was doing today is actually a little bit later than normal just because it actually is, it has been a little bit of a constructive Saturday. So um, I will be on for tomorrow for the ISTL, so tune into that. That is twitch.tv slash impulse. That is not my own stream. Uh, check that out. I will be doing that for the Indie Star team link and I will also be uploading more replays later in the week so if you would like to be a part of that send me an email uh, shoot me a private message on Team Liquid if you guys don't know my uh, my tag on Team Liquid is Vindicare605 uh, just hit me up if you would like any of your actual games cast uh, if you have feedback for my casting please let me know follow me on Twitter I'm at KT Vindicare uh, I will see you guys next time tune into the ISTL tomorrow I'm really really excited about it and if you're going to MLG I'll see you at MLG I will be at MLG Anaheim uh, I, you, I'm not very hard to find I do have this long hair and this very like you know Indian hippie look going for me which you know that's just it's just typical me and if you ever actually get a chance to meet me you'll understand why so thanks for watching guys I'll see you next time